Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, introducing myself, introducing this masterclass series, and also introducing the speaker for today. Uh, my name is uh, Nigan Mugeherli. I am the Dean of the Law School at BML Munjal University uh, in Gurugram. Um, the BML Munjal University is hosting one of uh, what we hope to be a series of masterclass seminars on what we titled as uh, uh, When Tomorrow Comes. Uh, the idea behind these uh, webinars is to understand what changes we are going through, how we engage with these changes, what kind of mindsets and attitudes we need to have. We then succeed in these dynamic times. Uh, it's important, uh, especially in these times, for universities to take a lead in trying to understand what kind of skills, uh, attitudes, knowledge that we need to develop in both faculty and students in order to respond to these kind of changes. Uh, this is the first of this masterclass seminars on change. And we are very fortunate to have with us Mr. Sunil Kant Munjal, who doesn't require any introduction. Mr. Munjal, as we all know, is uh, the uh, founder member of the Hero Group. Um, he is himself a serial entrepreneur, a uh, noted educationist, um, has uh, been an angel investor in various uh, uh, concerns. And uh, my association with him has been mainly in his role as the chancellor of BML Mundial University. Uh, in that role and in his role as an educationist at various other institutions, uh, Mr. S.K. Munjal has played a reading role in trying to see how education institutions in particular, but also concerns of every sort, have responded to changes in our business ecosystem. So I welcome Mr. S.K. Munjal uh, to uh, this masterclass. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Munjal. Um, before we uh, uh, start the session, just a few housekeeping tips. Uh, all of you are automatically muted uh, while uh, um, the speaker uh, is uh, speaking and while uh, the moderator is talking. Uh, I'm sure many of you might have questions. Uh, please do uh, type those questions in, and uh, I will make sure that uh, Mr. Munjal uh, responds to as many of them as possible within the time constraints that we have today. Uh, the total uh, time that we have been allotted is about 45 minutes roughly, uh, with 30 minutes of the conversation between Mr. Mundal and I, and some time left for uh, questions uh, uh, during this time as well as towards the end. So let's uh, start this off, uh, Mr. Mundal. Thank you very much. One question I have, in fact, at the beginning, just to set the stage for uh, uh, for this talk, is what do you think we understand by the very meaning of change? Uh, is change inevitable in our professional and in our personal lives? And if so, how do we deal with it? So thank you, Dr. Nigam. Uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, my compliments of start and starting this uh, new series. Uh, I think it will be beneficial for a number of people. I understand it's not just the university students, but you also opened it to some uh, people outside of the university. So let me go to your, your question. Uh, this is an interesting word itself. There are many, many terms and quotations coined around the word change. The most common one one hears is the only constant in life is change. And in some sense, it's real. If each one of us thinks about our own lives, the lives of our family members, our parents, our friends, over a period of time, we a multitude of things which end up being different from where they were uh, some years back or sometimes even months back or when an earth shattering event happens like the one we are in the middle of now uh, then you start comparing with big world events uh, so the COVID-19 pandemic is now being compared for example with the world war with uh, the plague 
with the Great Depression and other such earth shattering events. So the the ability of human beings to handle change is absolutely enormous. And if you also see what they say through millennia, through uh, millions and billions of years, all beings have shown that it's not just the toughest or the strongest or the tallest or the heaviest that will survive and, and grow. It is always those who adapt themselves better to change. Those who are either able to foresee change or those who are more flexible and are able to change themselves. So both of these are important qualities in each one of us to own. We all have them, they're inherent in us, but it depends on how much of these we actually end up using. In a latent sense, we all have them, uh, but we don't, of course, all use them at, at, in the same degree. So it's important for us to, to constantly be looking forward while we live our day-to-day -day lives. It's also important to think a little bit uh, take a step back and think about ourselves, our lives, and the direction we are going in. And I'm not saying that for reaching any specific destination, but even for us to enjoy the journey of life, because it is the journey which is more important rather than only one destination. Of course, destinations are important directionally to, to demonstrate where we are going, what kind of a quality of life we lead, uh, what, what is the impression and reputation that we create about ourselves. Do we operate ethically or not? So these become important from, from the directional point of view. Uh, but change is truly constant. If I think about myself, I've, I've seen it right from literally when I was born. I, the day after I was born, my feet were put in a cast. I had, you know, I had a problem with my, with my legs. So um, very early on, uh, after class three, I left home and went to a boarding school. So you see a change uh, in that. Around us, a lot of change was taking place then. Uh, India fought a battle with Pakistan at that time. Then we had a, a, a skirmish with China uh, in those days. So change is something which uh, every generation sees. Uh, the ability to come out of it better off is what defines us as human beings. Thank you. Now that's really interesting. Um, you know what struck me when you were talking is the way you weave together um, both our kind of actual responses uh, to events that are beyond our control sometimes, but also our attitudinal, uh, our attitudes and our mental states uh, when we are confronted with these kind of changes. Um, it, it would be really interesting, I think, for the audience for you to uh, take us through that a little bit more. Were there any um, changes that you recall in your professional life, especially? Uh, you spoke about some changes in your personal life. Uh, any, anything you recall in your professional life that uh, you had to deal with and how you engaged with them and uh, perhaps how you overcame them? Uh, sure. Could you give us a little bit of uh, Sure, happy, happy to do that. So if I think back on the early days when I started to work, like many other members in our family, uh, I had occasion, even while I was at school and college, to visit some of our uh, factories and workplaces and get exposure. In fact, we used to get exposure at home because my father and my uncle, uh, we lived together in one home and every morning you could see them discussing the plan for the day. When they came back uh, home again, there would be some conversation. So some of that was, was exposure was there in the early days. So when I got a chance early on to start my training post-education, uh, I was lucky and fortunate to get to um, uh, intern, in a sense, in three or four different entities. I went into Rockman Cycles, which was then setting up a new plant in the focal point in Ludhiana. It was a new, very modern chain plant being set up, one of the most modern in the world. So I saw the concept of, of a startup starting a, a new business plan, a new construction, new civil works, factories being built and all of that. I also trained for a little while uh, in Majestic Auto, which was making mopeds. And then I spent a much longer time in highway cycles, which used to make um, free wheels and machine tools. Now, while I was there, I got the chance to lead a new initiative. And this was a unique initiative because it was the first time that as a family and as a business, we did everything new. 
we went into a new line of business. This was a spinning mill. Until then, we had all the businesses were attached to bicycles, mopeds, engineering, and manufacturing. And this was the first time we went into textiles, into spinning. First time we had an IPO for the company. First time we went to All India Financial Institutions for, for taking a loan. So there were many, many firsts in that. So I, I, I was quite fortunate. I, I spent a lot of time uh, learning about the industry, traveling the world, looking at how these businesses operate in places like China, Germany, US, Pakistan, Italy, literally at uh, all of the places which had a presence in the textile and, and the this yarn spinning industry. And we set up something which was quite unique. It was probably the most contemporary uh, spinning plant, uh, uh, multi-fiber spinning plant in the country at that time. But the interesting thing that happened was the week that we went into production was the same week when we had the biggest textile strike in the history of India. Datta Samant had led a strike, uh, and his name became famous because of that, uh, in uh, Bombay and in uh, what was then Bombay and in Ahmedabad. And all the large textile companies in India came to a grinding halt. So we had this amazing plant set up with no customer out there. So the change that we required to, to then uh, rejig the business model uh, was something that we had not even anticipated. So we thought we are not just going to, you know, lie down and, and roll over. Uh, we run businesses. We, we That's what we do. We are entrepreneurs. So we started exporting yarn. We were one of the early cotton yarn exporters out of India. We found markets uh, in other countries and we started making more of acrylic and other fibers yarn which was used in uh, the hosiery industry instead of going to the textile industry, the weaving industry, which had then shut down. So we did, made lots and lots of changes in the business model, in the product design, in including in layouts of some of the machines. So it, it kind of taught me personally uh, that whenever you plan something, also try and anticipate things that are not normal. So a black swan event was a term we had not it was not coined in those days. I think we heard this much later, but that it makes sense uh, for for us to be prepared uh, for un, for the unforeseen uh, situation. Uh, I saw such change taking place over and over in our companies. We had um, labor uh, IR situation in some of our companies in Ludhiana, um, some of our bicycle parts companies. Uh, at that time, then um, I uh, went and spoke with the government in Punjab to give us permission to shut down the, those plants because we had already started to make uh, motorcycles at that point in time. And these companies would have been better suited to make high uh, accuracy automotive components rather than as bicycle parts. So we were the first company to be given permission officially and formally to shut down those plants and convert them into a different business. So we were not only able to, to uh, salvage the companies, we, these became much bigger, much more successful, uh, and companies with a much more evolved sense of uh, design process, engineering, and manufacturing. So there are, I, mean, I can go on and on, the, the, what happened with Honda in the joint venture, what we did in the family, when we restructured the family business uh, uh, two times over, the, it was not just the partnership with, with Honda, but the um, exit of Honda from the joint venture, what was then called Hero Honda, itself was an interesting and, and, uh, and experiential change. So we've learned over a period of time that no matter what the change is, good or otherwise, that it is possible for us to find the, the silver lining in each one and try and make the best of it. If it's in any case good, try and enhance it. If it's a negative change, try and find the good in it, but don't allow this to get you down. Each time you fall down, you have to get up and use all the mistakes you made as learning for yourselves. Actually, the one thing that, um, that I take away from uh, this part of the conversation is that some of the challenges that you faced actually made your business uh, in terms of how you responded to it it actually made your business more nimble and even better than it was before and 
that to me is an interesting aspect of how we can find opportunities uh, in in adversity. So let me add something else. We haven't this. I'll tell you one more thing that we have done. If you think, look at all our big growth that has happened in the last 35 or 40 years in our companies, our biggest growth has always come during slowdowns. Each time there was a downturn in the marketplace and there was a slowdown, one of our competitors was down. We went ahead and enhanced our capacity. We went ahead and took a jump in our technology. Uh, we went ahead and invested in, in better processes. Because the, the twin advantage of that was, uh, one, we were, our leverage has always been very low. We're a very conservative uh, organization. So we don't like to borrow money if we can help it at all. Uh, even when we do borrow, our borrowing is, is very, very low relative to what uh, others in the market have been doing. But because the companies have been liquid, they've been they're throwing up cash, all our money is to go back into the, to invest in the business. So at each time there was a downturn, we would go back to, to enhance the company's capacity because at that time, everyone was available. Designers are available, contractors are available at low cost, machines are available at discount. So that each time the, the market turned around, the demand turned around, we were better equipped than many of our competitors. And that allowed us to take a quantum leap each time. We did not start off being the biggest company in each of the businesses that the group set up. Right from the early days, we were either the last or amongst the last to come into the business. And we were fortunate that because of the commitment of the teams inside the companies, the supply chain partners and the dealers and distributors, and of, of course, the support we got from customers, that these businesses were able to grow and overtake most of the comp competition to go on and become amongst the largest in each of the chosen uh, lines of business. So the adversity uh, or the challenge was each time taken on as an asset. Yeah, that's that's the uh, kind of really interesting aspect of what you just now said. Uh, business career with lots of different kinds of challenges uh, that you had to see and overcome. Could you give us some insight on a more personal level and the kind of role models that you might have had in this journey? Somebody that you uh, looked up to or somebody you admired for the way they responded to change? So there are there are people that you learn little things from all the time if if you have an open mind. So I can name some of them, but actually there have been hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people that I've learned from. Uh, one of the things I have attempted to do is to not believe that you have all of the answers when you talk to somebody else. Even if you are giving an answer, if your eyes, ears, and mind are open, you're able to pick up something from anybody who comes in. So the, the two things that I have normally attempted to do, and I will come back to the actual response to your question, is that anybody in our company that goes out anywhere, sales people go out to sell, purchase people go out to buy, communication people go out, anywhere they travel. So when they come back, I ask them to give us two things. One is anything that anyone is saying that is negative or critical about us, we would like to hear. And anything that anyone is doing better than us, I would like to hear. And when I'm saying better than us, it does not have to be only direct competition. It could be anyone in any business. So somebody stacking goods in a very good manner, that is good for us to hear about that. When you collate these two together, this allows you to constantly be in a mode where you're, we are craving and looking for improvement all the time. Because I can tell you the norm is actually quite the reverse. When most people come back into the company, Oh, their feedback will be, oh, by the way, we are doing so well that we are doing such a great job. Everybody is appreciating or praising what we are doing in the market. Our product or our service is considered the greatest in the market, which is, sounds very nice, but it doesn't actually help help any of us to really improve. So uh, from the early days, and I, I saw this uh, habit, I learned this actually from my father, that he had this unique ability to appreciate or praise anyone that he came across. If he was in a hotel room, and as it happens, he used to make the bed himself and, and, and leave every, every time he stayed in a hotel. But if somebody came in and made a bed, he would say, what a nice way this person is making the bed. So just simple little things that you're actually learning something from everybody around you. So he's, he's one person from whom I learned a lot in many, many uh, ways. And, and I was lucky that I got a lot of time to spend with him 
uh, once I started working, uh, I was working directly with him for, for many, many years. Uh, so I had probably more uh, occasion than many others uh, in the business, in the group, and even in the family uh, on, on, in that respect. Uh, but many of our leaders, if you look at people uh, like what Steve Jobs did, I'm going back a little bit what Mahatma Gandhi did. I'm talking first of the big, big names, uh, what Tagore did. Uh, and, and when I'm talking about uh, uh, innovation and ideation, it's not just about mechanical things. The philosophical things are so important for us to keep our minds open to. They, they allow us to have a richer ability to think, to anticipate change. And that too, by the way, I think comes from a much more open mind. And these are the th kind of things that many of, of uh, the people that we have read, read about, people we have read from, uh, have been telling us. And, and whether I look at economists like Tom Friedman, um, and incidentally, Tom Friedman had an opportunity. He may actually have become India's uh, advisor at one time. Uh, he was considered a uh, financial advisor. He may have had a different uh, financial outlook to the world at that time. So. Uh, my my attempt is normally is not to focus only on one or two or three people from whom you learn, uh, but I've learned from from musicians, from artists, uh, from somebody like Ravi Shankar. Uh, Ravi Shankar was the first one in India who started experimentation with the purest form of sitar playing. So I was always curious about these things as to how somebody of that caliber. Uh, with that kind of appreciation, go out and do something so revolutionary at that time. And of course, you know, he went on to become a global leader in, in the in the arts, and, and uh, he had a following across the globe, and not just in India. So uh, I, I attempted to learn from people, whether they are um, acknowledged leaders or not. It's fascinating to hear you uh, talk about inspiration because that's one of the kind of critical elements in the discussion we have been having about change is how do you teach people to respond successfully to change? You see, uh, you've been talking about values such as uh, courage and grace uh, and uh, a sense of imagination and creativity. Uh, but the question is, and this is close to your heart and my heart as well as educationists, is how do we teach or how do we inspire people to have those kind of attitudes, those kind of uh, qualities that helps them respond to change uh, better and, and actually come out as better people? So in the old days, it was often said that you are, these are inborn qualities. But more and more over the last 50 years, we have seen that these are actually teachable. And the best way to teach them is from a 360 degree exposure. First is the curriculum design has to inculcate some of these into the curriculum design itself. The, the pedagogy then comes next. How do you actually deliver these? How do you teach these? The number one um, uh, tool is demonstration. If the leaders, uh, the faculty, the professors, the teachers in schools, demonstrate these themselves through their everyday actions uh, is 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 quite unique that uh, you can say something to people and you can do something else it is certain then they will not pick up the message of what you said they will pick up the message of what you did and that's the biggest learning uh, you see this in in our homes very often when you have little children in your home you kind of ignore them when you're talking amongst adults. But people forget that children are like a sponge. They will absorb everything. And it happens to many of us when we are driving in our cars, when we are talking on a phone, we completely ignore the driver sitting in front of the car. And we talk as if there's nobody else uh, around us. So, but people will always see what you do and what you say both. So uh, I think that's an important one. The other one is to demonstrate to people that life is not always black and white. There's a line which continues to shift. So what is acceptable, what was acceptable, let's say 30 years ago in corporate practices, today you would go to jail for that. In schools, for example, the teaching methodology of schools 
in last year in Delhi, they put a principal of a school behind bars because he whacked a kid on his head. Now, physical abuse or physically uh, touching somebody for punishment is no longer accepted norm. So we also have to, to tailor uh, our expectations alongside what is the societal norm at that point in time. So governance norms, management norms have changed so much that it is important, therefore, to continue to apply this new lens all the time on integrity and ethics. What becomes more importantly important than these is, so for example, spirituality is more important than religion. Citizenship is even more important than morality. How do we become more responsible citizens of the world? Not just of the lane I'm living in, not just of the, of the colony in my neighborhood, but of the world. Each of us has a responsibility and a role. I was actually quite happy. The president, I think, in a speech of uh, earlier this year, I was, or last year, made a very interesting distinction between a citizen's charter and what our rights are and also what our responsibilities are. So we all have a responsibility. So it's, it's first important to spell these out and then demonstrate that these are all doable and those who are doing this are actually better off in life. They may appear difficult sometimes. In fact, that is, the, that is what makes people stand out from others. That's what makes true leaders stand out, that they're able and willing to take the difficult path and decisions. In fact, Gandhiji has given many, many quotes on this very subject that you're mentioning, that the, the, the straight path is not always the easy one, but that's the path which will get us to the right place every single time. Thank you, Mr. Mujal. Actually, some of the things you said uh, echo with me regarding some of the greatest teachers that I've had to uh, learn from in the past. Uh, even in the best education institutions, I think it's difficult to find teachers uh, who can truly inspire you, not just through their uh, words, but through their deeds as well. Uh, and I think one challenge uh, for education institutions in general is to actually hire and sustain uh, those kind of teachers. Uh, so that uh, uh, this talk about education institutions then brings me to a subject that you and I have spoken about at great length many times in the past and will continue to speak about uh, in the future as well, which is the future of education. So I have a, I have a few questions uh, about that. And one question I want to start with, I want to go from the particular to the general. So uh, one question I want to start with is, we are looking at a, a grave crisis, uh, uh, both uh, health-wise, ecological, as well as business that's arising now of historic proportions. We've never faced this before. It's unprecedented. Uh, we're all under lockdown, not just India, but several other countries in the world. Uh, the way we have been uh, educating our children right from school to university is, uh, is bound to uh, undergo a, a great change. Uh, you are at the center of this uh, in your role as the Chancellor uh, of, of BMW Munda University. Uh, when you heard about this and when you were in the midst of this, can you give us a bit of detail about how you responded to this uh, in your role as an educationist uh, to the, the uh, COVID-19 crisis? So my first instinct was to check on all the people who work in our schools, colleges, universities. Uh, I'm also involved in, in, so these are done by our family foundations. I'm also involved in, in some institutions outside, as you may be aware, of course, that the ISB, the IMM, the BAD, SRCC, and, and you know overseas as well. So my first instinct was to check how all the people there are doing, and are they equipping themselves to handle this uh, well? And we did not quite realize at the beginning what all was uh, uh, involved in handling this well. Of course, a few things had become apparent, but not everything uh, and then, until then. Uh, second was, uh, and I can tell you, for example, uh, I, I, um, I currently chair Dune School, as you know. What we did at Dune School was we isolated the school. We created like a mini castle. We said nobody will come into the school and we will make it self-sufficient inside and also nobody will go out. So we kept the school running even after the, the government of Uttarakhand gave an order to shut down all schools because we spoke with the administration and we said, frankly, uh, the students are better off inside the campus and they agreed with us. 
So the school kept running for some time until there was a COVID positive case found in Dehradun. And then we decided as a board and as, as a school uh, leadership that we cannot keep the boys, the risk has become too high. And we sent them home in 24 hours uh, after that. At BML Munjal University, we said, we will let the students go home. We will allow and encourage the faculty to stay on campus. So they are in a safe zone. And then in parts, of, because we have, as you know, we are fairly large campus and, and hostels are spread across the place. We said, we will also offer one of the hostels in a far corner to the administration to use as a quarantine or isolation. So it's our public service as well that we need to do while protecting our own people. What do we do to reach out? And the next thing was, how do we ensure that while we've sent the students home, that they also continue to get educated? Then was because the university, of course, has, has been designed with a fair degree of uh, modern template uh, of technology as a foundation, is how do you reach them? Uh, the tools are available. So teaching them uh, digitally, uh, remotely, uh, testing them where required, getting them into, into workshops and conversations. So it's a whole series of things that, that has been done at the BML Munjal University, which I think in some sense addresses the three I principle with which this university has been set up. The university demands that anything that we do must fulfill our filter of the three I principle which is innovation, sense of inquiry, and a positive impact on society. And the university has truly demonstrated all of these three by what it did in this time, uh, challenging time of a crisis, where many institutions just kind of, I don't want to be critical, but many just folded, many just shut shop and, and said, we are, we are uh, over, we're not doing anything right now. But there are so many institutions which have said, we will come out and support this initiative. We will provide training to people. We will provide education. We will provide succor in, in the ways we can. And uh, I think the university and right from the top, from the vice chancellor, the deans yourself, uh, the other deans in the university, um, the dean of the business school, the leadership team of the engineering and technology school, uh, all of you together with with the with the non-teaching staff, uh, I think put your best foot forward, and that's something we both highly uh, encourage and appreciate. Um, thank you. Uh, before I ask you one more question, education, uh, a question from the audience. Uh, so I thought I'll just put that in. Um, this is a very interesting question. They're asking after all these years, Mr. Munja. Uh, does change still worry you, concern you? Um, do you still believe there could be something out there that is completely unanticipated and that might uh, really be disruptive? So the answer is two parts. Uh, do I believe there's something out there not anticipated? Oh, absolutely, yes. But change excites me more than it worries me. And sometimes even on our own team, people get a little bit upset when I say this, that change is an opportunity in fact crisis is always an opportunity change doesn't always lead to a crisis but in the kind of change that we've had right now this is a crisis now this crisis is is forcing people to think of even looking at business that you no longer will accept the concept of a fixed cost as in your business that that you accepted earlier almost any and every company that i know of or who's come to me for ideas or advice I, i've been telling them this Let's look at the new concept of how we can run our businesses more efficiently, more effectively, uh, with lower resources, better outputs, better customer service. This is, this is an opportunity for India to make a step change. We do know that China, uh, for various reasons, political, because of this disease, because of its problem with the US and over the last uh, uh, year and a half, uh, has in a sense become the bad boy of the manufacturing world worldwide. People still depend on them. But here is an opportunity for India to say, let's go out and offer to large global companies a second opportunity because people are now building what they call a one plus one strategy. While many of them who are dependent or are in China do not want necessarily to give up completely, but they want an alternative to China. So here's an amazing opportunity coming out of this crisis. So each time, if you look at the silver lining, 
ensure that you are equipped well enough to handle the, the, the negative part of the change, but focus higher on what happens post getting out of this crisis. How do you equip yourself in this time? So my suggestion to all, all the folks who are listening is to use this time first to upgrade your own skill, both at work and find a passion and, and develop that. At the same time, use this time to uh, focus on new ideas for whatever the work or profession that you're involved in. Thank you. Uh, there's a question uh, from the audience, which actually uh, coincidentally is the question I was going to ask you next. So I, I, I promise that I'll go from the particular to the general in the area of education. And the question I wanted to ask you, which is a question an audience member is asking here, is um, quite apart from our responses to the immediate crisis uh, uh, because of COVID-19, how do you believe uh, COVID-19 and other such uh, crises will change the field of education in the future, especially the role of online education and technology? Sorry, I missed the last bit, especially the role of? Especially the role of online education and technology. Oh. Technology is role in sure. education. Sure, sure. So one thing is clear. If you look at uh, Zoom call, for example, this company had 10 million subscribers till three months ago. They now have 220 million. And the same thing is happening to Microsoft meeting, Facebook, what's called, all of them are, are going through this amazing uh, dramatic growth because people are saying, I may be stuck at one place, but I don't want to be only stuck. I want to be productive. I want to be communicative. I want to give some message out and I want to get something. So that is going to be one of the biggest drivers of change. So we have these mega trends which had already begun about seven or eight years ago. Uh, one of them was change due to technology. So technology is going to change literally almost everything in our lives. And education is a very good case in point. Healthcare is another case in point. Transportation is a third one. So if I just focus on education for, the, for a minute. So education is going to see impact in three different ways. Technology will change the process of teaching and learning. Technology will change the process of administration of an educational institution. And technology will change the process of communication of an educational institution. Uh, that is between the, the faculty and the students, between the, the institution and the parents, between the uh, uh, institution and its alums. So all these three will have a massive, massive change which will take place due to communication and technology. Uh, the process of... Um, 3D uh, manufacturing, uh, high resolution imaging, the uh, ability to, to design and deliver courses uh, online. Now, institutions or, or companies like Coursera, edX, MIT, et cetera, have been around now for well over 10 years. Uh, their popularity actually zoomed right in the beginning and then came down a little bit. Over the last few years, it, it had declined. But it has seen such an amazing spurt in these last few uh, weeks. Uh, it tells us that some of these habits that we are inculcated in this period of lockdown uh, will become permanent. Some, of course, we will spring back from. So education, I think, will benefit from a much more flexible model of education. So people will now look at education as a mix of physical experience, and a digital experience of physically being on a campus and meeting with people and remotely using and, and doing this at their own convenience and time. So this combination, I think, will become uh, a much more popular and a more centrist uh, form of education. Also, learning by rote will become less popular. Learning by doing and learning by experimentation will become much, much more important. And I think that will be one of the biggest benefic benefits that will come out of this crisis. Also, information and data management will become much more important. Uh, managing large databases will become more prevalent, and that will allow education to also lean on research as a much more active source. Uh, and we are seeing this happen first in the healthcare uh, field, 
but we will see this seep into all other areas and all other verticals of education as well. This will also, this, I'm going to add one more. This will also allow our teachers to be on a constant learning journey because they themselves will have to, to rediscover them this all of this time because a lot of this will be completely new information and a lot of this will be repackaged information in a new format. So some of these will be easy for them to switch over to. Some will be new for the faculty as well. So in many ways, the faculty will be uh, co-creating these with their uh, students and their mentees. Thank you. We actually have um, space for one last question. And there's an interesting related question from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. I was going to ask you a question, but this question is so interesting that I think I should take that as a last question. The question is very interesting. It actually flips some of the discussion we've been having so far on education and asks the following. It says, let's look at it, how the industry is going to change because of the COVID crisis and post-COVID crisis. And how should education respond to that change in the industry? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, oh, yes, absolutely. So if you look at what is the discussion going on, actually, I just came off a call just before I, I came in and, and started this session with you. I just came off a call with the industry. Uh, and you know, today, the new set of guidelines have been uh, declared by the Ministry of Home Affairs. And uh, some of us in Confederation of Indian Industry have been quite involved and uh, in giving suggestions to the government on all of this. So obviously, we're not giving this out of thin air. We are taking these suggestions from industry. So industry wants to become more practical. So it will also force. So at this moment, if you see in India, research institution, education uh, institution, and companies and business are in three different silos. And which is actually sad and, and uh, almost a shame, considering we have some of the brightest minds in the world, both in education and research around the world, are actually from India. So um, the NHS in the US, uh, in the UK, and, and the uh, health system in, in the uh, North America, the legal system, the accounting system, um, top, top end companies, they all have Indians uh, in leadership positions. Many, many of them have Indians. Uh, but if you look at India, we have never uh, uh, crossed this line. Uh, so research will become more practical, companies will be more involved, and education per force will become part of this uh, triumvirate. So all of these three will have to work together, teaching, research, and actual application of what is being taught to companies. So companies will push back to universities, universities will start to lean more uh, onto companies and, and, to, and teaching of things like entrepreneurship, of, of management, and cross-discipline management uh, with specialization and things like technology in legal services and accounting services, uh, in biomedical services. Uh, I think all of these uh, across the spectrum will become more uh, central theme rather than being on the fringe as they have been uh, until recently. Um. Thank you, Mr. Munjal. Actually, we have, I just see the time. We have uh, fortunately ran out of time now. We, um, so I'm sorry we won't be able to take all the questions. Um, uh, but I'm sure uh, Mr. Munjal uh, will be engaging us in several other conversations in the future. Uh, he's a well known speaker uh, on these topics, and you can hear him in various other fora. But I want to really thank uh, Mr. Munjal for coming today and giving us his time. Uh, the ideas that we have been discussing here today are not ideas that we just want to stop here and go away. Uh, these are things that are going to be discussed at various levels, in various shapes and forms uh, over the months and years to come. Uh, and I'm very confident that uh, uh, Mr. Munja and his role as an educationist and other universities will be at the forefront uh, of this conversation. Uh, thank you very much for the audience as well for uh, asking us some very interesting questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Munjal, for joining us. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you. And uh, thank hope you to see much. you again next week. Thank you. Hope to see you all again yeah. next week uh, for our next class. Thank you. Good evening. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.